to share my screen. Have a good Chodesh uh, Tov. Good new month, everybody. Um, so the um, we're coming toward the end of the uh, Thistle and Resurrection of the Rambam of Maimonides. And uh, he writes that um, There's, there's there's a lot of you know big questions actually about you know obviously what did the Rambam really believe um, you know because there's so many places in his writings where he leaves out the resurrection of the dead or he really downplays it just kind of mentions it um, you know and here he writes in theory a whole epistle that's saying he believes in it but at the same time that he says he believes in it um, he also says a lot of things in this book that you know it. it, it um, seem to indicate that, uh, you know, things like, um, you know, reiterating how the body disintegrates and how, you know, real uh, reward and punishment has to be sort of in a spiritual place. And, you know, he ends up sort of carving down this resurrection of the dead to some kind of very short, uh, you know, time, perhaps. And uh, then the question is, what what good is it, you know, if, 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 if it's just there to sort of fulfill this theological notion of resurrecting the dead, you know, and for, for five minutes, they're going to be resurrected, then they're going to die again and be souls for their true reward. So, you know, what's, what's the function of this, according to the Rambam, the way that he structures it? Um, he does say that, you know, he says we believe in it and you have to figure out what to do with all these verses that seem to go against it. And he quotes uh, several verses here from Job and other books. Um, you know, obviously what you interpret literally or, or allegorically is obviously a very big question. He doesn't have a lot of verses, uh, except the ones from Daniel, where, where it really talks clearly uh, that he cites that really talks clearly. Now, obviously in the writings of the rabbis, it does talk about the resurrection of the dead. Um, says the first question is what do you do with these and he says definitely we believe in it but we have like two questions you know what do you do with these verses that seem to deny it second question is uh the Torah does not mention this uh this principle and um the uh here, let's read 39. The second question relates to the fact that the Torah does not mention this fundamental principle at all, either in form or an illusion, certainly not explicitly. If one thinks it is impossible, the Torah should not cite even allusions to this principle. And when the sages quote verses, they ask, how do we know that the resurrection of the dead is based on the Torah? Their intent is to show that these are hidden allusions, that all the more so because the sages differ among these verses. And then the second question would be, why is this subject not mentioned explicitly? And if it's so important in Judaism, why isn't it mentioned? Um, rather, according to the person who thinks, it seems that the citation of a person who states something cryptically because he wishes to conceal it. So what's going on here, right? And then it's the Rambam first says, uh, you know, our ultimate goal um, was... Um, you know, to reiterate that we've already said in the Mishnah and in the Mishnah Torah uh, that we believe in it. In order not to leave the subject without benefit of new information, we saw fit to discuss two appropriate matters related to the subject. And so he, he's sort of saying here that the reason for this epistle is to deal with these two concepts. And the first is these verses that seem to go against it. Um, with the little reflection becomes clear that there is doubt as to whether such a verse in Isaiah is yeah, allegory really true, right? He's saying you could interpret the, one, the verses that go against the resurrection that is allegory and take the ones in Daniel as literal. Okay, you know, what to take allegory, what to take literally, it's, it's true, the Raman does choose that. Um, uh, some say, and, 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 but the second question is very hard to figure out. Uh, he says that it um, Torah doesn't mention it, so that seems to be a question on on resurrection itself, right? Why, if it's so important, why doesn't the Torah mention it? And then he says, um, and when the sages quote verses, they ask, "How do we know the resurrection that is based on the Torah?" Their intent is to show that these are hidden illusions, and all the more so because the sages differ among these verses. 
then the second question would be, why is this subject not mentioned explicitly and with such clarity that no interpretation would be needed? Why isn't it clear in the Torah? Rather, according to the person who thinks, it seems like the citation of a person who states something cryptically because he wants to conceal it. See, so I think what he's saying is the Torah doesn't say it clearly because the Torah is trying to conceal it. Um, so, so you know, is he is he pro or con? Right? It seems sometimes hard to know the problem. In response to the first question, I hereby state the words of the prophets, language of the holy books, are narratives describing the existence of nature in its usual manner. It is well known that nature as it exists includes the union of females and living beings with males. Um, so, uh, uh, and they have offspring and they grow until the being dies. It's not part of nature that the being will return and exist again after its death, right? He says the resurrection that is not part of nature. However, it is part of nature that when things die, they don't come back. They dissolve and disintegrate into the elements, right? So he says the first question, um, it, it, and as he says, the reason that it's not mentioned in the Torah is the Torah is very disworldly. It wants to talk about things in nature. It doesn't want to talk about miraculous things. And the natural process for a human being would be not to be resurrected. Man alone is endowed with a measure of godliness, and therefore of necessity that this part of him remains and does not perish or become lost. However, the body of man perishes like all other beings. A person who searches vigorously into these deep matters can also provide evidence from searching proofs on the subject about the immortality, immortality of the soul, right? That he does believe in in spades, the immortality of the soul. The soul is where water punishment happens. It becomes united with God via the intellect and the, something called the active intellect. This is something which is part of nature. And this is what books of prophecy call the soul of the spirit in partnership with God. So he thinks the soul is part of nature, that it's well known, that it's obvious that the Greek philosopher is admitted to it. And the perishing of the body and its return to the elements, which species have formed, as is stated, um, this is the law. And the dust returns to the earth, right? The... Um, uh, what, right, the natural process, he says, should be that the body disintegrates and the soul joins with the divine. So that's why he's arguing the Torah doesn't talk about it, because the Torah wants to talk about nature, not miracles. Um, all these scriptural verses must be understood in this manner. There's no difference between the verse, if a man die, may he live again, and the verse, shall we draw water for you from this rock? But I guess what he means by that is, just like we take this one literally, uh, we would take this one literally, because neither is part of nature. It's in fact impossible by natural means. Right? You can't get water out of a rock by natural means, and you can't be resurrected. Rather, the water issues out of the rock through a miracle. So, too, the resurrection of the dead is under the divine miracles. Right? The Rambam can't deny it because he believes in miracles. The problem is he can't make it very much part of the world. He can't make it a long-term thing. There is no difference between the verse, can the Ethiopian change his skin and wilt thou work wonders for the dead? Um, uh, and the appearance of a white hand uh, miraculously became white, right? Moshe hand becomes white with leprosy. So, um, so he's, he's saying there's, there's nothing to say about resurrection of the dead in the Torah because it's a miracle. The Torah is not interested. There's, there's nothing theological to say. It's just a miracle. And if a person should assert that it is impossible for an inanimate object to move, he would be speaking the truth according to the laws of nature. And this assertion would not be invalidated by the changing of the stick into a serpent, right? Which Moshe does in last week's parsha, because that was a miracle. Similarly, with all the scriptural verses, which seem to be in opposition to the doctrine of return of the dead, they refer to natural means. Now, he's saying that all the things that deny the resurrection of the dead, it's because they're talking about nature, they're talking about real life. But such verses do not contradict the return of the dead for the mighty wishes them to return. He says miracles still happen, just like the, the stick turned into a snake. And he will say later that the snake turned back into a stick because that's very important. Because or else, if it stayed as a snake, it becomes part of nature. And 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 then it's not a miracle. Thus, the con is by miracle by definition is something short-term. 
Hence, these scriptural verses should be elucidated for you as much as possible in a logical manner. There's no need for you to be able to interpret any of them. Okay. Uh, you don't have to interpret them in opposition to the resurrection of the dead. Just understand that those places where Torah does not, where it seems to deny the resurrection of the dead, it's because it's talking about nature. Know the denial. So from here, we'll read straight through about 10 paragraphs um, because these paragraphs at the end are really kind of what summarizes the Ramam's ideas. Know that the denial of the return of the soul to the body is based on one of two reasons, right? People who deny it is either because they reject the resurrection of the dead, because it's not a natural phenomenon. According to this reason, he's forced to deny also all the miracles, right? If you say it can't happen because it's too, it's it's not, nature doesn't allow for it, then, then you have to get rid of all the concept of miracles. And the Ramam does believe in miracles. Um, although he tries to work them into nature. Um, or he rejects resurrection because it's not explicitly stated in the Torah. Um, and if that's true, then you're just, you know, denying things in the Torah that are miraculous. We've already explained that there are scriptural verses which prove the resurrection of the dead, like the ones in Daniel, they're very few. Um, and if he asserts that we should interpret those verses as we interpret others, we would say to him, Right, if you say, take the two verses in Daniel, which talk clearly about the resurrection of the dead, and interpret them allegorically, we'd say that what forces you to explain to these words, the fact that the return of the dead is not natural, and therefore you interpret these scriptural verses so they coincide with natural phenomena. You might want to do that because you, you want nature to stay intact. But then you have a problem, because what are you going to do with changing the stick into a snake and the descent of manna in the desert and the pillar of fire and cloud? Right? You're going to have to interpret all of those natural phenomena away. You will have no miracles. Do you need miracles? We've already explained in the guide um, when we discussed the inception of the world, right? creating the world from nothing, that if one believes in the creation ex nihilo, if you believe in creation out of nothing of the world, one is of necessity forced to believe all the miracles in the Torah possible. But why is the Ramam, why is that so important? In other words, he says, you have to believe in miracles. Why? Because or else you wouldn't be able to believe in the creation of something from nothing. What's the Rambam kind of focused on here? The answer is that Aristotle believed that the world was there forever. He did not believe the world was created. He believed um, that there couldn't be, there, 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 there philosophically, scientifically couldn't be creation from nothing, that nothing is actually comes into existence or out of existence. Um, there's a conservation of matter and energy. Uh, now, obviously, that's true in our world, but th that doesn't mean before our world was created that was true. Um, so the Rambam here has like it's a bit of an axe to grind, right? Because he does not hold like Aristotle, even though there's a lot of pressure on him in his own mind that he hold like Aristotle. Um, and so you, you, you to say that there's no resurrection of the dead because we only believe in natural things. Well, then you're done with with Torah's vision of creation. And, and, and it's not so much the other miracles that are so important, that you could find a way maybe to find an allegorical interpretation of turning the snake into a serpent. But for the creation of the world, ex nihilo, the Ramam would not do that, because uh, that's a very important philosophical principle, uh, especially because it goes against the Greeks belief. Among these is the possibility of resurrection. Um, right? So believing the possibility of the resurrection of the dead is believing in miracles. Therefore, we believe in every possible occurrence, if it is related to us by a prophet, we don't find it necessary to interpret it allegorically or to remove it from its literal meaning, because we believe in miracles. Nevertheless, certain things whose literal meaning are impossible, right? There, there are, he's going to also divide up miracles into different kinds of categories. But he says there are some things that we cannot take literally. We have to interpret them allegorically. And that namely is the corporality of God the physicality of God. Even though the Torah talks very clearly about that, we have to interpret it allegorically. However, that which is possible remains as it is, right? And as if, if you can take something literally in Torah, you should. He strives to explain the resurrection of the dead in such a way that the soul does not return to the body. He does so because he, is, because he believes it's inconceivable to the human intellect and it's not part of the laws of nature. He's forced to the same conclusion about all other miracles. Uh, now, I, I don't know if you have to say that, by the way. I mean, you could say, you know, you could say there's more evidence in the Torah for other miracles than this. Um, there's very little evidence in the Torah for the resurrection of the dead. 
So it, it, as we read this, the question I want to ask yourself is, is the Rambam being straightforward? Is he hiding something? Right? Because we know that the Rambam believes that there's a way of communicating to the masses and communicating something else at the same time to the scholars, right? You can hide and reveal. He says this in the introduction, I think, to, to the guys who are perplexed. Uh, how you phrase things, you can actually be giving one message to the people who don't understand much and can't and a different message to the scholars. So we might want to ask ourselves, is the Rambam, you know, is he straightforward or not? Or is he trying to hide a real opinion? Um, all this, however, is totally impossible according to the belief in the eternity of the world. Right? If you believe in the eternity of the world, as Aristotle did, then, then everything's natural. You can't believe in miracles. He who believes in the end, in this antiquity, is not at all considered to be part of the congregation of Moses and of Abraham. In other words, he's forced into believing in miracles, even though he might not want to, because what defines the difference between being uh, um, a Neoplatonist and a, a Neo-Aristotelian um, and, 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 and a faithful person in his era, or being a Jew in his era, is a belief in that the world was created. I believe in these fundamental principles, consider them uh, the resurrection of the dead's literal meaning. Kind of, in other words, accusing the Rambam, maybe the part of the reason he has to write this epistle is that if you accuse the Rambam of not believing in the resurrection of the dead, it may not be just about that. It might, that might be an accusation that he wouldn't, that he's so moved as a scientist that he wouldn't believe in miracles at all. If you don't believe in miracles at all, then you don't have to believe in the creation ex nihilo. And if you don't believe in the creation ex nihilo, well, then I, you know, that's what's going on. The, the big argument that the Rambam's time is that. Uh, what makes you, you know, what makes the Jew a Jew. Now, the Rambam does say in the Moran of Uchim that if he believes philosophically, in the eternity of the universe, he would interpret Genesis metaphorically. He does say that. So it's an interesting question, by the way. This was written the last year of his life, the second last year. Did the Rambam change over time? Because it seems like the Rambam didn't have such a such, such a religious problem with, with the eternity of the world that he, he could have believed it. But here, he really seems to have trouble with it. You know, here... Um, you know, he's like, yeah, you have to believe in the resurrection day because you have to believe in miracles because you have to believe in the creation. So, so it does not seem like he was so vehement about believing in the creation ex nihilo in the Guides of the Perplexed. Now, the Guides of the Perplexed was written much earlier. Let's see how many years between them. Guides of the Perplexed was written in 1190. And the Rambam, and this was written. 1194. Let's see. That was the last year of his life. Let's see what year he died. Let's say 1190. Oh, he died in 1204. So there's 14 years between when he wrote Miranda Buchim and when he wrote this. I think this was written in the last year of his life. Um, that's, that is quite a bit of time in a life that only spanned 70, 60, let's see, 38. Um, he lived 66 years. It's not that long. Um, okay. All right, so we will do uh, part nine and ten, and then we will we'll finish this epistle. Uh, the, the last two paragraphs are, 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 are interesting. They do lay out, and you can see that you know, he was sort of playing with ideas before, but now he's sort of a little more explicit. All right, have a good day. Thank Bye. you. Yeah. Thank you.